According to The Guardian, lockdown measures significantly increased levels of stress, anxiety and depression in the UK. And according to the American Psychological Society, Americans across the pond also felt the stress of living in lockdown. However, this probably comes as no surprise to many of you, as we have all been living in difficult times in isolation throughout 2020. In light of this, we want to dedicate this episode to happiness and explore what makes us happy, along with actions we can take to improve our levels of happiness in our everyday lives based on psychological research. Hi, I'm Sam Breakgear and welcome to Brains Bite Back. Your podcast dedicated to all things psychology, technology and society. Today we are joined by Assistant Professor and Chair of the Sport, Exercise and Performance Psychology Programme at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Alan Chu. Dr. Chu joins us on the show to discuss research relating to happiness based on positive psychology, the PERMA model, positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning and accomplishments. He highlights four specific actions that anyone can carry out and shows us how to implement these actions in our everyday lives. However, research surrounding happiness is not as clear cut as we might expect, and for some, it is a controversial field of research considered counterproductive to achieving happiness, as we will later see on this show. But before we kick off the show, I just want to say if you like this episode, then please follow us and subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. And we also want to hear what you think of this episode. So let us know if the information, actions and practices shared on this episode has helped you in one way or another. And you can reach out to us on Twitter at, at The Sociable. Alternatively, you can leave us a review on iTunes or a comment on YouTube. And if you're interested in more topics like this, some previous episodes for you to check out of Brains Bite Back are the therapeutic powers of ayahuasca, smartphones and mindfulness, understanding the new wave of meditation apps and chatbots at the front line of online therapy. Now, let's kick off the show. Alan, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm really happy to get started with this. Uh, so on the topic of happiness, we'd be able to kick us off by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background in studying well, happiness in general. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I am Dr. Alan Chu. I'm a sports psychology professor and also the chair of the new master's program in sports exercise and performance psychology at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay in the United States. As a professor, I teach sports psychology and other psychology courses such as research method and statistics in both graduate and undergraduate level. I personally also do research on motivation, mainly in athletes, but also in the general population, uh, as well as some positive psychology strategy that we will talk about today, how to enhance happiness and well-being. As a certified mental performance consultant, uh, CMPC in short, I also work with elite athletes and performers on achieving the peak performance through mental training. Uh, such as using visualization, using mindfulness, uh, which is related to some of the strategy that we will talk about today. And I hope uh, things that we go over will be helpful for you uh, based on my experience and based on a lot of science behind it. Okay, awesome. And uh, I think that sounds great. I mean, personally, I love sports and sports makes me pretty happy as it is. So I think combining those two is a pretty good step forward. And obviously this year we need uh, some advice on happiness more than ever because it's definitely a stressful year to say the least. So with that being said, I know you've come to the call today with uh, four different steps that people can take with these evidence-based techniques. And I'd love for you to be able to kick us off with the first one, if you could please, Alan. Yeah, absolutely. So the four steps or the four strategy are based on uh, the concept of mindfulness, and gratitude. So I'll start with the step one, uh, mindful breathing, uh, which is a technique that we take a deep breath. And very importantly, everybody could do it with me if you're listening, try to breathe in for a couple of seconds, breathe out a couple of seconds. Uh, and then now this time, try to put one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly. 
And I want you to feel that when you breathe in, your belly is expanding. Breathe in, breathe out. One more time, breathe in, belly expanding. Breathe out. So this first strategy, mindful breathing or deep breathing uh, is a technique that help us activate our parasympathetic system, meaning the system that make us more calm and relaxed uh, instead of the sympathetic, meaning the system that give us more stress and anxiety. You know, I think during these days, as Sam alluded to, we have so much stress from the pandemic uh, but also other things in our life that make us feel anxious a lot of the time. Uh, if we can just take a minute of a minute or two each day during lunch, after lunch, to just take this break, that will help us tremendously with activating the sympathetic system and have more relaxing responses to go through our day. Uh, and we are more relaxed, as we know. We are we tend to be happier. And I. Also want to emphasize that the goal is to have better well-being than just happiness. I mean, happiness is part of it, but when we talk about happiness, um, a lot of time we talk about short-term emotion. You know, for example, we can get happiness from uh, eating, drinking alcohol, but those are not always the best strategy for us to get happiness in the long term. Uh, so to get well-being, being mindful, uh, being aware of things around us and taking a couple of deep breaths help us realize that um, we can be relaxed and we have some control over our life uh, as, soon, uh, as easy as just through breathing uh, itself. So I hope that helps for the best strategy. Yeah, no, it definitely does. And I did it just then with you. And uh, you can immediately feel the difference even within a few seconds. And I have to say that during this quarantine, it was very stressful for me. I'm based in Colombia and we had a very strict quarantine where we were not allowed out uh, for many months, just one day a week, a designated day a week. And uh, it was very stressful for me. I couldn't have visitors in my gated community. So I actually got into meditation and I, I used my breathing and to focus on that. And I definitely noticed the difference from my day to day life. So uh, I think you're, you're absolutely spot on with that. And um, uh, I know that your second point is somewhat similar. It's on the, uh, it's on the mindfulness level. Would you be able to explain the second point of your four step plan? Yeah, absolutely. So the second step is mindful self-compassion exercise. Uh, it's based on the concept of mindfulness, uh, meaning that you are being aware of your thoughts and feeling in the present moment. Uh, and to speak a bit about, more about the benefit of mindfulness is that when you are focusing on right here, right now, you are not thinking too much about uh, the worry about the future. You are not thinking too much about the past, maybe something that makes you sad, but just fully enjoy the moment that you're living uh, here. And then self-compassion uh, adds two more components. Uh, one is common humanity, meaning that we realize it's not just ourselves, not just me suffering, uh, but there are also other people who will suffer in their life. Uh, and I think during, during this time, it's even more, even easier for us to realize we suffer uh, from the pandemic together one way or another. So that's a common humanity piece. And then the other component that self-compassion add is self-kindness, uh, acting compassionately and kindly toward ourselves. Uh, think about when you talk to your family and friends, I feel like a lot of time we talk to them in a very positive way, encouraging way, but we don't always do that to ourselves. You know, for example, if I make a mistake uh, in sport or when I make a mistake in my work, I sometimes beat myself up and you know maybe telling myself, "Oh, you suck, you're terrible. How could you make that this simple mistake?" Um, that may happen to us during this time of pandemic too, uh, regarding work and life in general. So I think uh, adding that self-kindness could help us release some stress. And that's also based in science and research that we have. Uh, and in order to apply it, we will uh, start with a couple of deep breathing uh, again, you know, the first strategy that we just practice. 
So everybody uh, close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths, breathe in, feeling your belly expanding. Breathe out. And as you keep breathing, try to follow me, follow up what I'm saying and say that to yourself. I'm feeling really stressed and anxious right now. Everybody feels this way sometimes, particularly during this time of pandemic. May I be kind, gentle, and understanding with myself. As you are ready, you can open your eyes. I know this is a relatively short activity that I did. Uh, there's a lot more exercise on the internet, uh, particularly the website of the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion. Uh, so the three statements that I talk about, you know, when I talk about I'm feeling really stressed or anxious right now, just being grounded and center ourselves with our thoughts and feeling uh, if we feel stress or anxious. But then the second and third are very important, you know, realizing that everybody feel anxious uh, sometimes. In that way, we are connected to everybody uh, rather than feeling lonely that, oh, it's just us feeling this way. And then the third statement, may I be kind, gentle, and understanding with myself, uh, just to be more self-compassionate uh, when we say that. Uh, there are many different modifications that you can make. If you like other statements to be more kind, uh, people like different statements. Sometimes people like to say, oh, can I be more understanding? Can I be kind uh, to myself? Can I imagine other be people be kind to, uh, to myself as well? So there are multiple ways you can modify those. But the key is to have mindfulness, taking a couple of deep breaths, uh, feeling the common humanity, knowing that other people feel this way as well. And then finally, saying something to ourselves that are kind and understanding. And sometimes, you know, I would say that you tell yourself things that you tell your best friend and your family would be the best way to approach this self-kindness. And I hope this help uh, everybody and I hope this help you too, Sam. Yeah, no, definitely. I gotta say this is the first time ever as a podcast host that I've been worried about being too relaxed on a call um, because I could easily fall asleep with these, with these sessions that we're running through. Um, but they, they, I, they can definitely feel them like immediately. You can feel that response. And I know exactly what you mean about the inner voice. We actually have a guest coming on the show soon to discuss about um, dealing with the inner voice and how it impacts us. Because I think as we evolve with technology and if Neuralink, which are uh, I think uh, Elon Musk is working on other companies becomes a thing and we have this technology implanted on our head, then we're going to need to be able to control our inner thoughts and our um, yeah, inner voice more than ever. So yeah, I, I think that uh, was a fantastic exercise. And uh, I'd love to know about number three, if you could share that with us. Yep, sure. I'll uh, just to pick it back up on what you said, you know, that the inner voice is huge. You know, I think our automatic response is really saying negative things to ourselves. And I think particularly the more ability we have, the higher we perform, the more likely we see those things because we are perfectionistic in some way. You know, like I work with elite athletes, you know, a lot of time they say to themselves that they have terrible performance, even though they are elite athletes. So just to kind of validate what uh, Sam just mentioned there. So for the third activity, uh, I have gratitude journaling. I think a lot of you may be familiar with the term gratitude, uh, expressing our gratefulness to other people or saying thank you. Uh, but gratitude is also a, uh, also a positive emotion that we have. When we express gratitude, we tend to feel more positive, even though we may be struggling with things around us. Uh, so for this activity regarding journaling, you can think about the best plan regarding your schedule 
uh, based on research, it says that if we express gratitude about at least three to five times a week, that tend to increase our happiness, well-being, uh, and pretty surprisingly, that help us with better habit in eating healthy diets as well as exercising more. So with the physical health aspect as well. Um, so for me, I personally do a gratitude every Sunday and I would list on a spreadsheet five specific things I'm grateful for for this past week. So for example, uh, this past week, I just had my last week of classes. So I expressed my gratitude um, actually both to my students in class saying that I'm grateful for their hard work. I'm grateful for their openness this semester, being able to navigate the learning through the pandemic. And I'm also grateful for the best attitude um, in this class. So I, I express gratitude in person, but also I did it on a spreadsheet to remind myself uh, what I was grateful for that week. I think a lot of time we say thank you in our mind, but based on research, if we write it down on a piece of paper, keep a journal or write it on the computer, that tend to help us be more, could be more mindful, going back to the concept of mindfulness uh, to get us happier. Uh, if you like it, you can do it in the morning. Uh, I have heard from some friends that work for them. When they do it in the morning, they feel more energy for the rest of the day. Me personally, I like to do it uh, by the end of the week. Some people do it uh, in the evening. Uh, find the best plan for you based on your schedule that will work best for you. Uh, there's a caveat here about the gratitude is that it had to be something really authentic and something that you're not comparing yourself to other people. What does it mean when I say not comparing yourself to other people? Meaning that when you express gratitude about having good health, probably you just express it that way rather than I am grateful that I have good health, but then other people uh, are sick. I feel sorry for them. Uh, Richard says that when we do gratitude by comparison, we actually feel a little bit worse because we are looking at more the negative side of things as well. So focusing on what you have rather than what other people do not have when you do that gratitude. Um, and try to have some variation, uh, thankful for different people and different things that you have in your life just to really appreciate things that we normally do not realize, such as um, healthy food and water that we can get in this country, uh, in the state uh, where I'm at right now, and maybe just the education that we have or the technology that we have. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I am just grateful that I can go back outside. And I know that's probably a, um, a harsh thing to say since some people currently don't have that opportunity given the lockdowns. But I think, yeah, if there's one thing that uh, the lockdown has taught me is uh, to be grateful for a normal life or life just being normal. And I'm looking forward to that again. But I was interested about what you said about the research indicating that writing it down is important because I personally have tried to be more grateful. I've tried to be like more mindful in the sense that I would stop and pause and I would have perhaps taken a view uh, and I would try and take that in and be grateful for being able to see that and or just anything, just like small moments to be more grateful. But I, as you stated, like journaling, writing it down has a bigger impact. And uh, I'm personally going to take that on. I'm, I'm going to start doing that myself. And then I know that you have um, a fourth point and that relates to gratitude as well. Would you be able to share that with our listeners, Alan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the fourth one is my favorite one, is the gratitude letter writing activity. Um, so this, I think kind of combining all the activity that I mentioned regarding being mindful and being grateful. But at the same time, you are doing it not with only yourself, but maybe with other people too. So for this gratitude writing, it could be a letter that you write to someone you appreciate in your life. And you can write that letter uh, by expressing a couple of things that you are grateful for. You know, for example, now thinking about my parents who actually live pretty far from me. I'm from Hong Kong originally. So my parents have been giving me a lot of support throughout my time uh, in the state in the past 10 years, gave me a lot of opportunity 
for my education. So if I write, I were to write this letter to them, you know, I would list at least five things I'm grateful for them uh, that they've done for me. Uh, so I can do that letter electronically and then email them that way. But what I would like it more is that if we do it by using our handwriting, if we write a letter and then actually deliver to them in person, I think that that adds an additional component of in-person human connection. Uh, but of course, right now, I know it's more challenging to do so, you know, during the uh, so-called like quarantine or social isolation, isolation period. But maybe if you are willing to, to write a letter, send them through mail. I feel like that would take an additional effort more than just sending an email. What that means is that you have some happiness expressing those gratitude. But the people you are, but also the people that you are grateful for, they also receive a gift from you. They receive a gift of gratitude. And at the same time, they are sharing the moment of joy and appreciation together. I actually just did it this Wednesday with my student. I told, I told you that I expressed gratitude to them in person, uh, but then I gave them a, a small gift. Uh, I gave each student a, a, a gift box. And then in that gift box, uh, I wrote one thing that I was grateful for each of them uh, very specifically. Um, and I wrote different things for different students and also included a message, uh, which is a message saying, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. It's actually a quote from Kung Fu Panda, but this quote really um, kind of summarizes what we talk about, enjoying the present moment, focusing on what we have, today and live it to the fullest. And in that way, you know, we can't remind ourselves we still have a lot of joy, a lot of happiness in our life that we can appreciate. Kind of combining the four steps that we've talked about and I hope um, you really take it with you and do it at least with one person in the next week or two, especially during this holiday time. Uh, based on this recording in this December 11, if you listen to it after the holiday, you can still do it with your friends and family, which is a great gift for you and for them as well. Awesome, excellent. And those are some very wise words from Kung Fu Panda there. I, I would love to keep up with what you're doing and I'm sure many of our listeners would as well because those are some really good pointers and I'm personally going to incorporate these into my life. If people do want to keep up with you, Alan, do you have social media or do you have any kind of website that you work on? Yeah, so I do have a Twitter and a personal website. My Twitter is at Dr. Alan Chu. So it spells D-R-A-L-A-N-C-H-U. And then my website is dralanchu.uwgb.org. Uh, UWGB stands for University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. Um, so connect with me there on social media or go to my website. I'll be happy to chat with you if you leave your contact information on my website as well. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining me today, Alan. Thank you again for having me, Sam. I appreciate the opportunity to speak about happiness and gratitude and mindfulness. My pleasure. While I do believe Dr. Chu's tips can help us become more mindful, grateful and considerate, thus resulting in a greater sense of happiness, I wanted to explore another side of this field of research. And I spoke with someone who has left this research behind to pioneer a different approach to achieving happiness. I spoke with the Chief Digital Officer for Active Wellness, a company that delivers wellness services to inspire people toward a healthy, active life. He is also the author of The Fun Habit that will be coming out next year, Dr. Mike Rucker. Mike, if you're ready to get started, then uh, could you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background in psychology? Sure. Uh, Dr. Michael Rucker, uh, I have a PhD in organizational psychology. Um, my focus has primarily been on workplace wellness um, with regards to my professional career. But last year, I sold a book on positive psychology called The Fun Habit to Simon Schuster coming out next year. 
in 2021. Um, and that's based on, you know, being a zealot of positive psychology for quite some time. I'm a charter member of the International Positive Psychology Association. But in 2016, my younger brother died and I was at a place in my life where I had kind of been an advocate for happiness for quite some time, but was in a period in my life where um, a lot of kind of the tricks of the trade were failing me because I didn't want to um, quote unquote identify as happy. And so being a good researcher, started digging into some of the literature and realized that there was this research gap in having the agency to have a life full of positive valence and positive affect without necessarily feeling like you had to be happy. Um, and along that journey, also realizing this emergence of research in the last decade that shows, especially in the Western world, that people that are fixated on happiness like I was um, actually potentially can be doing harm. But realize that you know, the pursuit of happiness, if it's guided you know, along the right path, isn't necessarily wrong per se. But if we do it really in a self-centered fashion, a lot of times it will lead to dismay. And so, you know, digging into really understanding why that's the case um, has been what I've been focusing on kind of as a side hustle for the last four years and found a lot of fun in it and, you know, a lot of self-discovery and also a lot of things to share with other people. Awesome. And thank you for joining me today. I'm actually really interested to have you on because it wasn't too long ago that I actually saw a piece on the New York Times, it's opinion piece. And it was focusing on uh, the idea that happiness won't save you. And it looked at similar to like what you said, the research surrounding happiness is somewhat misleading. They pointed to the fact that there's a famous study more than 40 years ago called lottery winners and accident victims is happiness relative. And it was a really interesting discussion about how this was conducted and what this showed and what people have taken away from this. But the surprising part was that really shocked me is that um, Philip Brickman, the psychologist behind this, who was a uh, supposedly rising star. He committed to it. Yeah, he did. And I, uh, that was an incredible like uh, turn in the story for me. And um, I, yeah, I, I kind of like was really inspired to have you on because I think that like what kind of what you're saying is almost reflective of what this article was saying. And I wanted to get your opinion on this. So, I'd love to know a little bit more about like what kind of developed after that. And if you go into a bit more detail about what you found and how your perception of chasing happiness has changed and what you kind of, I want, I don't want to use the word chase now, but what you strive for, I guess would be a better, better way to say it. Yeah. And I think, you know, to answer that bluntly, I don't strive for anything per se. So that's ultimately one of the follies of, you know, this sort of prescription, right. Of self-help and, um, others, and I certainly was a purveyor of that prescription, is that ultimately, one, happiness is a social construct, right? So the idea that we've quantified it is already means that it's sort of human made, right? And so we're trying to understand something that's kind of mystical in itself anyways, because, uh, you know, we define our own happiness through the words of our culture and things that have sort of been prescribed to us. And so when we assign meaning to it and you know which is going to be things that sort of the tools of uh, vocabulary and heuristics and things of that nature it, it inherently is selfish and selfish things tend to lead to unhappiness right so there's this paradoxical effect that if we value happiness especially in the western world in the way that it's defined that you know we need to find it within and that's not possible you know, again, that gentleman's suicide is is a great example where he was likely had a biological deficit where, um, you know, finding sort of serenity in the day to day was elusive. You know, he put a lot of his happiness in his relationships and the ability to publish. Um, these are all very self-centered, right? Rather than developing um, the marriage, he kept kind of, you know, his own marriage. He, he was sort of critical of it. And we don't need to uh, you know, that's a good piece. So I'm not going to do it justice by surmising it. If, if someone wants to look it up, um, that history is very interesting. Uh, but there have been a host of other researchers that have looked at this. Iris uh, Moss out of uh, Cal has done a great study called Can Seeking Happiness Make People Unhappy, where they looked at this. Um, and then there was a great study out of Toronto in 2014, uh, Desperately Seeking Happiness, Valuing Happiness is Associated with Symptoms and Diagnosis of Depression. And again, what these studies find that's, I think, kind of 
unsung, you know, when you dig into them, that it's a very Western problem and that uh, Westerners, let's see, got happiness or trying to somehow better themselves rather than attaching themselves to things that sort of connect them to the outside world. And so from a fundamental sort of social psychology aspect, the underpinnings of why uh, there's potential harmful effects there is that we know that when we celebrate the gains of anything, right, when we sort of understand this idea of abundance and that we have agency to bring good things into our life, that's generally not bad. But this pursuit of happiness, what it does is says, okay, the Joneses down the street, you know, have uh, a good life. What, why is there this big fissure? Why is there this gap, you know, between myself and the Joneses? And the problem is, is that when we perseverate on that gap, it tends to lead to a lot of negative outcomes, right? And so we only have a finite amount of time, right? I generally, because it's easy to use it as a vehicle, I generally talk about 168 hours in a week, right? Um, because if you talk about it in longer terms, it tends to get more too macro to sort of, but if you're spending a lot of your time in that 168 hours, perseverating on this gap, you know, and identifying as unhappy, uh, you know, identity is a big part of how we experience subjective reality. And so you now identify as someone that's not as happy as they want to be, so therefore unhappy. And all of a sudden now, hour after hour, week after week, you're identifying as unhappy and you slowly become that, you know, and it's, it, it's, it's unfortunate. And so fun isn't something that you necessarily need to identify with. It's, you know, it's an affect, it's an activity. And so I like that more as a reframe because if you're just trying to have more fun, it's not necessarily like there's an end goal. It's just like, you know, you're trying to do something week after week so that you can index more joyful moments. And over time, those joyful moments will contribute to uh, a greater sense of well being. That's interesting. I'm particularly interested by the fact that you were saying it's a Western problem. And personally, as someone that comes from the West, someone that's, uh, I'm British, but I live in Colombia. I can see that they are way happier here. And I think that the truth is, is because there's definitely a greater sense of community here. There's a greater sense of family and the importance of family. And on top of that, they all love to dance. Like they're always loving to have like music on and dancing. And uh, I can definitely see why that is a selfless act. It's you're connected and you're kind of caring for, for others. And on top of that, you're having fun. But I would be interested to know, like, what steps have you taken to add more fun into your, your weekly life? Yeah, so for me, I look at what I'm doing in any given week. And if there are things that I can turn down, like if there are things that are negatively affecting my ability to create joyful moments, I'll uh, take those out if I can, or potentially delegate them, you know, to someone that might be able to do them better or is better suited for it. And then I look for opportunities where I can create fun. So a lot of times, you know, it's simply just being aware that there are these opportunities in your week to do a different activity than the one you're doing. So an example that I like to um, use often is my wife and I realized that there was this daily uh, routine where uh, bathing our children became a true sort of agonizing task for us because our children didn't like it. There's sort of this sense of duty that they had to do it you know, so they were, it wasn't really enjoyable for them. And it always led to the screaming match. And it was, you know, time just kind of wasted for the four of us. And so looking at that activity critically, and realizing that there, were, there was potentially a different way, we began to strategize, like, how could we use this time better? And we're not in a financial position where we could get a full time nanny. Uh, but we could certainly, you know, find a part time resource to, to help us out with that. And so we had to get past the hurdle that bathing your children is this intimate act. And like, for some reason, if you have a full-time resource to do that, that's fine. But like to bring someone in just to do that one activity seemed a bit strange, but why is it any more strange than someone that's, you know, able to assist with your kids full-time doing it? Uh, my wife and I happen to live in a college town. We got a college student that we trusted to do that and come in a few hours out of the week to kind of help us with that activity. And then we swapped that activity for going out. And so now my wife and I, you know, use three hours out of our 168 um, to have dinners together. And we've reconnected and our marriage is better for it because we replaced three hours of a lot of unfun for four people 
uh, with three hours of a lot of fun for two of us and our kids really love this person. So for whatever reason, you know, her baiting them is, is a lot of fun uh, for them too. So this sort of uh, one plus one plus one plus one equals a lot of dismay. Now we've sort of, you know, increased the enjoyment for everyone just by a simple switch and being mindful of how we're spending our time. I think that's a, a good approach to, to assessing your time and just generally looking at it, I think. And obviously, that's a really nice story. I would also be interested to know, and this is my last question, you have this uh, play model. Would you be able to describe it for our listeners and explain what it is? Yeah, absolutely. So it's in conjunction with what I just described. So four quadrant models are usually helpful for dividing up anything and kind of understanding how, you know, you're approaching a particular problem. So I use that for the ability for someone to be critical of how they're using their time and kind of looked at, you know, ways of increasing positive valence in any given hour, right? And so play stands for pleasing, living, agonizing, and yielding, and looking at activities under these four quadrants. So pleasing activity is kind of what we're shooting for. You know, it's stuff that's energizing um, and that we can do in our day to day. Uh, living is activities that sort of bring up awe and wonder if you can do them. Uh, they tend to deploy a lot of energy. So, you know, ultimately you can't, you know, if you do these all the time, you'll eventually burn out. But we certainly want to inject those into our day and day so that we can sort of connect to something bigger than ourselves. Agonizing things are activities that really, really grind us to the core. We might have to do them, like, you know, doing your taxes or there might be things components of your workday that you don't like that you just have to do because we all do have duties, you know, to be uh, participants uh, as humans in, in, in this game that we're all collectively playing. But a lot of times you can reduce those. So, you know, oftentimes you'll see that you engage in habitual behavior that you just don't need to do, that you're just doing it because you've always done it that way. But if you can um, look at it critically, um, there might be a better way. I mean, another simple thing that we did was, um, you know, vacuuming the floor, you know, we were like, how could we do this better? And we just got a Roomba. And I know that's something simple, but a lot of times if you're not like, oh, well, you know, that's just what we do. We vacuum, you know, we have a big house. We vacuum the house for an hour every week, even though we hate it. Oh, wait a second for $300, you know, now for the rest of my life, I don't need to vacuum my floor. So that's an opportunity, you know, like a quick antidote, how I took, an agonizing hour out of my week by a 300, simple $300 investment. Um, and then yielding is activity that we think are bringing us joy, but often aren't, right? And so, you know, a common example of that is social media scrolling or binge watching something on Netflix that if you look back critically, you can't remember doing, right? So um, I've gotten called out for villainizing, you know, watching too much TV. And I certainly think TV can be a pleasing activity. If you look back at it, you know, perhaps you're watching a really engaging show with friends or your partner. Um, and so you're spending that time in a way that if you look back at it, you'll look back at it as a fun and happy experience. But oftentimes, a lot of our habitual behavior is really just something that if someone asked you, you know, a week into the future, what did you do? Uh, you won't remember it. And the problem with that is that we've looked at longitudinal studies of you know, the aging well um, and folks that have engaged in long-term habitual behavior that didn't really contribute to their life, we know that our brains store that as a single memory. And so they'll look back at a life and because these you know, habitual behaviors are kind of um, condensed within the way that we store memories, uh, we don't dilate time and we tend to have a, a lot of regret as we grow older. So it's important to look at these yielding activities, sort of habitual activities that aren't really fun and don't really contribute to joyful memories um, and see if we can use that time more wisely. You're, yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on because I love hiking, but I sometimes need a bit of a kick up the butt to go and do a hike. Uh, and I can easily, I could easily like watch TV, spend my Sundays watching TV. But if someone pulls me out of the house and takes me for a hike, I definitely feel way happier uh, then I would be if I was just lazy and watching TV. And also it's like, a, it's a memory. Like I have clear memories of like the hikes I've done, the places I've explored because of that. So it's funny how there is a disparity between what we think makes us happy or not even necessarily what we think makes us happy, but what we kind of 
uh, gravitate towards versus like the actions that we can take to actually make us happy. So that, that really resonated with me. Mike, if people want to keep up with what you're doing and follow you or learn more about this sort of thing, uh, how can they get in touch with you and how can, can they keep up to date with you? Yeah, so my website's michaelrecker.com um, and on Instagram under The Wonder of Fun. And then the book, The Fun Habit, comes out in 2021 uh, via Simon & Schuster. So um, I would be grateful for anyone that would support the book. It's been a four-year journey getting that together. But anyone that wants to learn more about the science of fun, I promise not to disappoint. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today, Mike. Thank you, Samuel. This episode is brought to you by Publicize, a digital PR company that grows businesses' online presence. And for a limited time only, exclusive to Brains Bite Back listeners, you can receive an SEO assessment as part of your package for any tier of service at no extra charge with this special promotion. To find out more, visit publicize.co slash BBB. We are finished for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And as ever, you can subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcast from. You can follow us on YouTube and go to social.co to check out all of our episodes and articles on topics just like this. We hope you join us again soon. And until next time, take care of yourself.